This episode of The Meat House is brought to you by Amoretti, the ultimate manufacturer of brewers' natural infusions, craft purees, and concentrates to bring your next batch to the next level. Click on the link in the episode description below to see their full lineup of flavors. Use promo code MEATHOUSE at checkout to save 15% off your next order. All right, so uh, let's, oh my God, there we go. Now we're hot. <laughs> we're hot and we're streaming. <laughs> Holy crap. I swear. How about that? <laughs> and, and people are listening and probably going, what the hell is going on over at the Mead House tonight? A little too much Mead, people, I guess. I don't know. But, uh, you know, and I just got through. I just got through setting this whole thing up. The mics are hot. Everything's working. had g- good volumes, everything. And I got the crew in, Aaron, Mississippi. Uh, Jeff's not going to be with us here tonight. Uh, and pushed all the buttons and uh, opened the show. The music's playing. And I look up, and there's, like, no volume on the output. Like, who am I talking to? You know, <laughs> but hey, we are on the air now, and uh, welcome to the Mead House. Um, gosh, now I lost my place. What were we talking about before we were so rudely interrupted? <laughs> Making mead. Making mead. <laughs> <laughs> well, back in the saddle again. I think is how I initially opened the show that nobody heard. Uh, we were on break for a couple of weeks, so uh, it's kind of good to be back, uh, you know, doing something constructive. Um, and um, I think, um, well, I mean, let's just start off with the usual stuff. Uh, the Facebook deal. Uh, I went to Facebook tonight and uh, scrambling around. Wait. We had new windows installed in our place today. So it was like, you know, I had to pull everything away from the walls and get everything covered up. And it was just a, it was just a pain in the neck. Uh, so we were kind of scrambling around, getting everything, all the furniture put back and everything. And, uh, so uh, I really didn't get a chance to sit down and really cruise through the Facebook pages. But I did manage to find one. This comes from Chad Wilts. Uh, on the Mead Facebook page, and uh, he writes, and there's a picture that accompanies his uh, his posting over there, and uh, he's heard it preached often about the importance of headspace in the primary. Oh, don't we know? Uh, but he's also, uh, you know, he he says he sees pictures of you know, regularly uh, of exploding carboys or airlocks that are just full of mead and overflowing. Well, he posted a couple of pics of a 10-gallon, some kind of a berry melomel that he's doing, and he's uh, he's doing it in a 15-gallon speedle uh, fermenter. And uh, the reason why, if you look at his two pictures at the Mead Facebook it's understandable because the first picture shows his mellow mel uh, just after he pitched his yeast. The second picture shows what looks like about a foot and a half of stuff <laughs> almost to the top of this 15 gallon carboy. And uh, yeah, no kidding. You need the headspace. Um, and uh, it's kind of funny to go look at his pictures over there, but uh, he did get the message by, you know, doing what the rest of us do, kind of cruise around, look, watch, listen, learn, uh, and don't do what other people have done. So uh, Chad Wilts, uh, awesome post, buddy. And I uh, told you I'd mention your name tonight. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, the Mead House here on Tuesday nights. Uh, like I said, Jeff is uh, away tonight, so he won't be joining us. He'll be back next week, I'm sure. Uh, probably getting a few emails from him uh, between now and then, I'm sure. Mississippi Chris in the house, Aaron Martin alongside. Uh, what are you guys drinking, Aaron? What, what's, what's your glass tonight? 
So for me, tonight, I'm actually finishing off the last bottle of the Melavino mead that Sergio sent up to us. Um, I, I think I saved the best for last, drinking some of his Midnight Jack. This is the dark fruit mead that has black currants, blackberries, black cherries, and black raspberries. And I have to say, this is probably one of my favorite meads, if not the best mead I, I think I can recall having. Um, just a, a really intense fruit flavor that, that you're getting there up front, and it's just really nicely balanced and rounded out by, um, you know, kind of the, the tartness from the fruits and the sweetness from the honey. Really enjoying this one. Wow. Amazing. Sounds good. Mm-hmm. Goes down easy. Mississippi Chris, uh, please don't tell me it's a Starbucks. No, no more Starbucks for me. <laughs> What you no, got in your I'm, cup? Well, I've got a uh, grapefruit tonic. It's tonic water, grapefruit juice, and a little bit of lime juice. Kind of that's, doing the healthy thing tonight. That's it? No libation, no alcohol, no, no not even I some got, rum? I got little a, gin? I got or? a podcast to do, so I better, better not. <laughs> I got a broadcast to <laughs> do. <laughs> while, while the rest of us sit here and drink ourselves into oblivion, Chris is going to keep us straight on, straight as an arrow here. Uh, JD, next week we may need to put Chris in control of the, uh, yeah, the sound. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should be running the equipment. We wouldn't. Be you know what? I can, absolutely. You know what? And I can fix you up too, bud. I can fix you up. Uh, yeah, I don't even. Uh, I, I'm lucky to be able to check my email, so you don't want to do it. Yeah, just uh, just as a guy who spends his spends his days operating on people, and he hates computers. I mean, go figure. Um, every every he does everything on his smartphone. I mean, his email. He cruises the internet. Uh, everything on his smartphone. So, and I'm uh, about to upgrade too. I'm getting the newest, latest, and greatest, and uh, so it's going to be even bigger and better. What the Samsung Seven Note? <laughs> well, I'm, getting, I'm getting the new iPhone. Oh, iPhone, iPhone Seven. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was going to say, stay away from that Samsung deal. Apparently, the battery's been exploding in them. So, um, bad news there. We'll get uh, the new iPhone 7 Plus, so we'll see how that works out. There you go. Uh, well, what's JD drinking tonight? Uh, JD is having the final glass out of a bottle of Pinot Noir. It's called Raven. Uh, this is a home uh, home wine kit that we made here, uh, appropriately named Raven. Uh, it's my wife's favorite uh, style of wine. And uh, it's a little bit early still, um, starting to starting to uh, develop. Uh, we took some uh, samples when we bottled, and it was still, boy, it was really kind of rough around the edges. But uh, even after just a few months in the bottle, it's starting to come around. So uh, I'm hoping by Christmas time uh, they're going to be pretty good, at least good enough to give away. So. Uh, not quite, uh, you know, not quite twenty dollar a bottle, but uh, just a tad over the two buck chuck that you might get at Trader Joe's. So, hey, what the heck, you know? Um. So, uh, I, I kind of wish Jeff was here tonight because I wanted to continue on a little bit further with this braggart thing. So, I guess Jeff is just gonna, Jeff, if you're listening, you're just gonna have to catch up, bud. <laughs> um. You know, we left off a couple of weeks ago. Well, first of all, this, what did you guys do over the couple of weeks we were off? Aaron, what, I, you did some traveling. I saw the pictures. I did, yeah. So the, the first week I was actually in Cleveland on a business trip, but then the second week I uh, took a little vacation with the wife, and we did a, a little tour of Wisconsin. So from Milwaukee, which is kind of the southeast portion of the state, we went over um, to Madison, and actually while we were there, had the chance to tour 
a really wonderful meadery, the Boss Meadery. Um, the owner, Colleen Boss, gave us a very informative tour, and we actually helped her celebrate, I think it was the four-year anniversary of her meadery there. Oh. Um, so so that was really fun. Um, then uh, other than that, we just kind of cruised up north to the northern part of the state, up by Lake Superior, and, and just had a real nice relaxing time. Drink a lot of beer and, and drink a lot of mead. Um, so now getting back into the swing of things. <laughs> Perfect. Madison, yeah. uh, isn't that, uh, aren't they, isn't they, um, weren't they famous for uh, the boat races? Uh, Miss Bardall, Miss Budweiser, Miss this, Miss that. You know, Is I am St. Madison. I'm not sure to tell you the truth. The uh, hydroplane boats, isn't that kind of where it all started? Was in Madison somewhere? Sure sure could be. I, I may have to look into that and get back to you because I'm, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I'll have to look it up too, but uh, it just rings a bell. Uh, Mississippi, what you do during your two weeks? Well, I've been focusing mostly on one of my big hobbies, which is leather work, and I've been doing a lot of that. Uh, suddenly, all, all of a sudden, I got all these projects coming in and uh, still have some waiting. In fact, you've got one waiting for me that I haven't gotten to yet. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been I've pretty much had uh, in, in all my spare time, that's what I've been doing. And uh, <laughs> So, and I've uh, I've been through so many ren you know revisions on the design that it you know don't feel like you're rushed or anything. <laughs> so, well, that's the problem. See, the longer I wait, the more you're going to keep changing things. <laughs> <laughs> you can get on it and get it done, so you so you can't change anything else. Make it more complicated, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, you're, uh, you'll say I'm stuck with it now. So. <laughs> oh boy, um, yeah, we still need to talk about that too. But uh, like I said, there is no great hurry. I imagine I'll be here for a few more years at least. Um, and we'll talk about that little project here uh, in a little while. Well, you know what? Now's as good a time as any. Anyway, we, we just bump this one up to top of the list. Uh, my two weeks off was basically spent building this uh this kegerator project and i i tried to document uh as much as i could and i put a little story about it up on the uh, on the website themeathouse.com oh yeah we do have a website themeathouse.com we also have a facebook you can get to it from themeathouse.com it's just simply the the meat house uh, on facebook um we uh you know, I just, I, I've been in this, I've been, for a long time I wanted to brew beer, and I, I, uh, I finally got around to doing it, and um, the bottling thing, I can see now where these beer brewers, you know, I mean, a bottling is just a pain in it, I swear, um, and you don't, you're, you're kind of stuck, you're limited on what you can brew, too, because uh, if you if you bottle your beer, you obviously you have to mix priming sugar in it to get the carbonation, and you have really no control over it at all, uh, other than the amount of priming sugar that you might use. And of course, there's, I mean, there's even formulas out there for that. And I think it's roughly four to five ounces uh, for a five gallon uh, batch of beer, but. Uh, I mean, if there's uh, if there's any kind of residual sugars in there at all or anything, I mean, they're going to get chewed up by whatever yeast might be in there chewing on the uh, priming sugar as well. So you're, you're, you're kind of limited uh, on what you can brew. So I thought, you know, maybe it's time. And uh, I started looking around uh, and wound up ordering a whole a whole kegging system. I mean, the, the kegs, the, uh, the beer lines, the spigots, the, the everything, CO2 tank, uh, the whole nine yards. And uh, 
picked up a uh, you know a little cheap Danby uh, refrigerator. This, of course, after doing lots of research uh, and really looking out there, you know what people were doing, the kinds of refrigerators people were using, and it runs the full gamut from uh, from filthy, dirty, used refrigerators that people pick up for like ten bucks to brand spanking new giant, you know, 48 cubic foot freezers. Uh, I mean, it runs the full gamut. Um, a popular one out there is this little Danby mini fridge. It holds two kegs and a CO2 canister uh, cartridge, you know, a cartridge. Hell, it's a tank, it's a five-pound tank. I think you can even, you, you could probably get a 10-pounder in there if you wanted to, but uh, you'd only be able to put one keg in, but. Um, so I, uh, I got this refrigerator and, uh, you know, laid my plans out and, uh, went to work on it. And, uh, so that's what I did for my two weeks. Uh, it's got a tile top on it. Uh, uh, you know, I, uh, I had discussions with, uh, Mississippi even about what I was going to do for the surface and everything. And I mean, it went from copper to uh, wood to different uh, different things i wound up using tile uh and um you know got it all laid down grouted in uh i need to seal it up now uh that's the last thing i need to do to the tile but everything works uh hooked up the beer lines uh i had made a uh, five gallon batch of a uh a dark uh, a porter uh, kind of a coffee porter uh, a little variation on the recipe. I had it sitting on about uh, not quite two ounces, about 1.4 ounces of uh, dark roast uh, a coffee bean, just a raw bean, not crushed, not ground, not nothing, just the whole bean. And it came out uh, pretty good. My wife likes it, and uh, that was the important part. So, of course, there's a I guess the, uh, you know, the the part of this whole deal, I mean, the reason why I wound up with a keg grater, the explanation that I was going to use for my wife was, you know what, honey, I'm going to make you a beer, your favorite beer, but I need this kegging system in order to put it in. See, how that's how it works. <laughs> like how you parlayed that. Well done, <laughs> sir. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm taking notes. <laughs> Yeah, you. If you want a kegging system at home, make your wife's favorite beer, uh, and <laughs> and tell her that you. You know what, honey? I just I, I in order to make it come full circle. I got to have one of these kegging systems. You know. So, if uh, any of our listeners have a good recipe for a good grapefruit hefeweizen, give us a call. <laughs> <laughs> so. So that's what I did for my two weeks, and uh, we're awful proud of it. It's a two-spigot uh, little deal. Um, Chris is going to help me out with a uh, kind of a tower thing. Uh, we're going to build out of wood and leather. Uh, and I'm just, gosh, Chris, I, so many freaking ideas, uh, and I've got pictures of you know that I that I've saved off of different places that I've been and seen. Uh, you know what other people have done and uh like i said i mean it's gone from one revision to another about about once every other day so <laughs> sometimes the best thing you can do is uh send me some pictures of what you have send me some measurements that, of what you require and then just forget about it and let yep. me do my thing and <laughs> yeah. uh you know, because sometimes when you get more than you stare at something for so long and you sort of run out of ideas and it's good to have someone new just to come in and do something. So that's true. That's true. So maybe maybe I can just look at what you've got and get some measurements from you and we can just go from there. Well, you know, I, I, I and I spent, gosh, you know, sit here for hours and hours and hours going through all these. And homebrewtalk.com is, is a great place to start. And they've got a section in there about home brewing. And it even breaks it down into sections uh, on, on all different kinds of things. Of course, one, one form section they have in there is about building kegerators and keezers. 
And uh, there's just countless pictures of what people have done. So, yeah, I, I went through about half of those. There's there's roughly 400 some odd uh, uh, pages of, of building these kegerators, and they all have pictures. So, uh, so yeah, I got lots of pictures and uh, got some good ideas. But um, you know it, uh, and and I knew absolutely nothing about carbonating uh, you know other than what i read you know what came in the instructions for the the first beer which was that pumpkin deal that i did uh and that involved just mixing four ounces of priming sugar in some hot water and adding that to the bottling bucket and then you know bottle your beer and but that, God, that is such a pain um Goes through the whole bottle capping thing. And I even went out and bought a fancy, you know, fancy dancy bottle capper. Um, and I imagine we'll still bottle some too. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested in that uh, beer gun. Uh, what did you call it? The Blickman beer gun, I think, Chris? Yeah, the Blickman. That's yeah. what you want. Yeah, and that'll allow you to still bottle, uh, you know. Fill growlers, uh, that kind of thing, and and uh, and do it the right way. So, but that was my uh, that was my two weeks off. Um, and like I said, you can go to the meathouse dot com. Uh, it's pretty well documented up there. What I did, what I used, uh, what it looks like. Uh, the Danby refrigerator is the refrigerator of choice, uh, at a, apparently for. A lot of people who are, you know, limited on space, and uh, it's easy to work with, uh, and they're cheap. I mean, I think we paid uh, like 125 bucks for it at Costco. So, uh, I mean, at that point, I really didn't care about the warranty. I mean, you know, when you drill the two-inch hole in the top of the refrigerator, it pretty much you know, your warranty pretty much goes out the window. So. Um, You're going to need that Blickman beer gun, though, because uh, if, if that only holds two kegs, uh, I know you. I know how you brew. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, you start a new patch every third day. So. I know. <laughs> I, I was just talking to a friend of mine the other day, and while I was, you know, looking around, he asked me, he says, how, how many how many projects you got going? And I look, I turn around in my chair, and I'm looking behind me, and I'm thinking, and I'm looking and I'm thinking, holy crap, I got like 35 gallons of stuff. <laughs> I've got 20 gallons of wine. Uh, I just put five gallons of beer in a keg. Uh, I've got, uh, what, six gallons of mead. Um, so and both of my fermenters are empty. Can you believe that? And they've been empty for a week and a half, or more you than know, that. You know, there is a limit. There is a limit on home brewing. At which point you have to <laughs> apply for a license. <laughs> Might want to check into that. Yeah, I think it's like two hundred gallons. Uh, it's a hundred gallons per adult here, uh, and I think that's the federal law, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, well, you you hit that like what April? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more like February. <laughs> but uh yeah, I I really I got a I got so much going on wine. I've got a 5 gallon wine that I've got to get in bottles uh here just shortly because they're going to have to sit uh for about, you know, 4 or 5 months. Um but uh and and this next project, I'm really you know, we're not done really going through this whole braggot thing yet. And uh, I've been looking at different different ideas of recipes, and, and I've pretty much nailed it down to one. And uh, I'm going to do this, this bourbon barrel uh, porter uh, that uh, it's a kit beer from Northern, uh, Northern Brewer. And uh, we're going to one-up it. Uh, with some honey, and that, that's about all I'm going to do to it uh, is just add the honey. So 
you know, I, I don't know what to expect out of it. Um, you know, looking to take the alcohol up to somewhere around. I really don't want to go much more than about 10%. I mean, I don't know how you guys are approaching yours. Chris, uh, uh, talk about your idea, because we were kind of tossing around a couple of different recipes. I settled on one, which left you open for that other one that we were discussing. What's your, uh, what's your theory? I mean, do you have any direction you want to go with it? Um, you know, I've been thinking about it, and, and actually I, I talked to my wife about it, and we have decided on the Irish red ale Irish rather, red. Than the, yeah, okay. rather than the stout. So that's a, a recipe that I already had, but the recipe that I had had no specialty grains. It was just a dry malt extract. Uh, it, it had a dark uh, malt extract that, that was used. And really the only thing that made it uh, uh, an Irish ale was the fact that I used an Irish ale yeast. Uh, but I guess for this experiment that we're all going to do, uh, I'm going with a kit. And it's, it's an actual Irish red ale kit that's going to have specialty grains and... Um, the, you know, I'm, I'm like you. I'm going to make some adjustments to the kit. Um, I'm going to go with a different hop, uh, well, a couple of different hops and some different hop profiles, um, different quantities. Um, as far as gravity, I'm, I really haven't dialed it in yet. Uh, I've, I've given it a little thought, and, uh, and I'm thinking probably, I don't know, probably like it's going to end up around 11%. We'll just have to see. Um, but, yeah, I think I'm going to stick with that, rehash it, and see uh, see what we can come up with on it. Yeah. Aaron, have you uh, been looking at recipes? or? Uh, I have. Looking at? Yeah. yeah, and just, you know, Chris, I know we've talked a little bit about the, the red ale, Irish ale, on some previous podcasts. I think that that's a style that would lend itself very well to a braggot. That you know, red ales, Irish ales, kind of have a, a pretty nice malt sweet profile, flavor profile to start with. And I think if you add in some honey on top of that, sounds sounds like that'd be a good one. So, um, and JD here sounds really awesome as well. So for me, what what I'm looking at, at putting together for this recipe would be a black IPA. And for anyone who, who doesn't know what that is, it's um, kind of a cross between two different styles of beer. So for those of you that, that like a real dark, you know, roasty type of a, a beer, like a stout or a porter, it, it gives you that kind of a, a dark malt profile but then it combines it with like an India pale ale hop profile as well. So it's a very, very intensely hopped beer as well. I'm um, looking at this recipe. I, I kind of am at, at this stage of the game, blending uh, the black IPA kit recipe, which is also available from the Northern brewer with the Northern brewers braggot recipe, actually a, a recipe that I have used um, in the past a couple of times. It's the one I sent to you, JD. Um, so in terms of the, the starting gravity on this, it looks like it would be about 1.110 of the starting gravity. Um, so, so that's kind of what I'm looking at putting together. And, and I think it would be kind of an interesting recipe. I, I really like black IPAs, just the, the style of beer I think it's something that, that would be really different if you kind of kicked it up a notch with the honey. Yeah. Um, I was just looking at this recipe for this uh, bourbon barrel porter. Now, I, I still really haven't gotten that involved with hops yet, but it, go, it, it uses uh, Golding's. Uh, and uh, Chinook uh, hops, the, the Chinook or the uh, the long boil, the 60-minute boil, uh, you know, they go in right at the beginning. But the other two, one's at 15, the other one at five minutes. 
So, uh, you know, and I know, you know, I know there's, you know, flavorings come out of one set, bitters come out of others, aromas come out of, you know, even a third. Uh, and so I don't know what these hops are going to contribute. So that I need to look up next. I need to figure out, you know, goldings. Is that uh, what I want to use uh, for this? I mean, uh, or do I want to go with something else? That's interesting. Those those are the two that I'm going to be using. I'm going to use the Chinook um, and the East Kent Goldings. So, uh, yeah, the, uh, the Goldings are going to be the aroma. And you're uh, you're pretty familiar with those, uh, or you've had experience with those before? I take it. Limited, <laughs> very <laughs> limited, and and to get me to ask to to answer what they each of them do no i can't do that but you know i wonder uh, i wonder if there's a list uh some kind of a document floating around out there that uh you know you can look down the list and get some kind of a profile uh on what these hops contribute i'm sure uh, there is and you know on the, on most of the, the homebrew sites that you order supplies from they'll have some sort of description uh, along with each each kind of hop, so um, I really need to look that up because I may end up going with Eroica instead of uh, Chinook. I'm not sure yet. Um, it, I, I think what I need to do is uh, uh, you and I probably need to collaborate on it, figure out what you're going to do, and then because uh, uh, I've got some options on mine. And uh, so, you know, I may, like for instance, I could go with uh, uh, Eroica instead of Chinook, or I could go with Cascade or Centennial instead of the Goldings. So uh, I don't know. We'll. I'd like to do. I'd like for all of us to do something different. So if you're going to do the Chinook and Goldings, I can. I can switch mine over. Um, but with this being an Irish. Um, I don't think it would matter too much because the East Kent Goldings, they're going to, I don't know, in my mind, they take it more toward an English ale than an Irish. Well, um, I just found a, uh, I just found, i got to make the damn thing bigger so I can read it. Uh, I just found this uh, on homebrewstuff.com. This is Hot Profiles. Uh, and I just, I'm going to bookmark this and then... Uh, maybe cut and paste into a document that I can just kind of put away in my documents. But uh, Golding, uh, four four to six percent alfalfa or al- alpha acids, alfalfa acids. What the hell. Um, domestic uh, finishing hop, uh, refined, gentle, frag- uh, fragrant, and pleasant with flowery tones. Uh, has produced some of England's best bitters uh, used for all English-style beers, uh, ales, ESB bitter, Belgian-style ales, uh, barley wines. Substitutes are uh, East Kent Goldings, uh, Chris. Uh, Fuggles, Fugle, I guess, uh, Will- Willamette, uh, and... Uh, I think that's a Styrian. I don't have my other glasses on. Styrian Golding. Uh, fragrant, pleasant, with flowery tones. So is that something you're looking for? Uh... Mm, yeah, sort of. That, that's, uh, that's more toward the English ale. Uh, so, you know, I may go with uh, some of the others. I don't know. See now, right off the bat, okay. I'm thinking, I'm thinking flowery. I mean, what is this flower stuff? It's, I'm looking at a bourbon barrel porter, and without, you know, if I just ran the recipe the way it is, uh, this has a 16 ounce uh, of bourbon that goes in secondary, uh, along with some oak. So I'm not quite sure how the refined, gentle, fragrant and pleasant with flowery tones is, I, I don't know if that's even suitable for, uh, uh, 
this this uh, 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 braggot or this beer that I'm looking at, well, braggot, ultimately it'll be a braggot. Aaron, what, what's your... Uh... So I just sent the group an email here. This is um, a, a table that I had put together maybe a, a few weeks ago, J.D., when, when we had that discussion about the brewing process and the different ingredients. Um, it's not a comprehensive list of hops. I, I think it's a list of about nine pretty popular hops in the Goldings and the Chinook, Cascade, those, those are all on there. Um, it lists out some of the flavor profiles, the alpha acid percentages, as well as recommended beer styles. Now, I had compiled this information from a couple of sources. Number one, the, um, the joy, complete joy of, of home brewing by Charlie Papazian, and then also just looking at information from the Northern Brewer website. So um, as far as the Goldings hops, it looks like those are used as like aroma hops, you know, very popular aroma hops for brown ales, porters and stouts, bitters, pale ales, um, not super hoppy beer styles, but, um, you know, if, if that's, uh, you know, your, your bourbon barrel is it a porter style? It seems like it, it could potentially be a good fit there. It's not to say that, that there aren't other hops that aren't even on this list uh, that, that would be a good substitute as well, um, but that might be a good starting point as well for just like a reference guide. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, when it comes to hops, I, I, I mean, I'm thinking – I'm thinking something that would complement the bourbon component here somehow. Uh, the the uh, malt is uh, ten, uh, one pound of English chocolate malt. I don't know what English chocolate uh, is, but uh, English chocolate malt, uh, a half a pound of English dark crystal, and a half a pound of English black malt. Uh, and then there's two pounds of wheat malt and six pounds, uh, 6.3 pounds of dark malt extract. Uh, but I guess those are the grains. Uh, the grains, the grains are the English chocolate malt, the English dark crystal, and the English black malt. Uh, and then the extracts are the wheat uh, malt, uh, dried malt extract, and then the, uh, six uh, pounds of dark malt extract syrup. So, uh, and that actually goes in at 15 minutes. That's, wow, six pounds at 15 minutes. Wow, different. Well, I'm thinking I'm thinking of the way you described those would go good with that style, J.D. It, it seems to me, especially, uh, yeah, because it's going to be, I mean, I think it's going to be malty for sure. And, uh, I mean, extra yeah. malty, actually. So, yeah, yeah a good... A uh, very light floral aroma, and you got to remember that's not flavor profile; that's just aroma. So, uh, well, but I'm wondering if that if that aroma won't won't conflict with the bourbon and oak uh, at the same time, though, because I mean, typically bourbon doesn't smell like flowers; it's going to smell of some smell like some you know, some kind of uh, level of oaking, and you're going to usually get some kind of a vanilla component out of that. Yeah, uh, floral and vanilla go good together. I they complement each So, yeah. well, vanilla comes from a flower, so. Well, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think it would go, I think it would go fine with it. Yeah, I mean, I you know, and I've even given thought to even just dropping, you know, maybe one or two vanilla beans. I don't really don't want to get carried away with the vanilla, but uh, maybe dropping one or two vanilla beans in uh, just for the heck of it. Um, so you know, the three the three components: the bourbon, the oak, and vanilla all go go very well together. Uh, and then, of course, I mean, uh, you know, then we're talking about the honey. I'm obviously I'm going to use the wildflower honey uh, that I get here. Um, and so there's, there's the big wild card here. Uh, we've all yeah. chosen these. We've chosen these styles, but what's the honey going to do to it? How's exactly. it going to change? 
you know, so that's the big wild card that we've got to figure out. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I mean, the honey is going in, you know, that, I mean, that's the last thing to go in. That's the very last thing to go in. Um, you know, because when I, when I, you know, on my cool down before I pitch the yeast, that's when I want to add the honey and take my gravity because, you know, I, I don't know. I have no idea how much honey it's going to take to get my, uh, uh, gravity up to, you know, where I want it. Uh, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm only looking for about 10%, uh, ABV. I really don't want to go more than that. Um, and this, that's sort of what I'm looking at. And one reason is because the, uh, the Irish, uh, red ale yeast that I'm going to be using, uh, has a 12%, uh, tolerance. And yeah. so I was thinking, I was thinking if I can start, get this thing to go about 10% dry, um, that that would allow me to go ahead and, and bottle condition this, uh, rather than keg it. And that way, uh, it's not the, my preferred way of doing it, but for those people listening who want to brew along with us and don't have a kegging system, then it would be something they could do as well. So. Yeah, I'm thinking I may just go old school on this and and then bottle condition it. Yeah. Well, and see, mine's going to go right into a keg. Uh, it's going to come out of secondary and and, and uh, go on, you know, go into a keg. In fact, it might even spend. Well, uh, it will. I mean, I, I I'm going to come out of secondary, wait till it all clears and everything, then put it in a keg. But I thought about just dumping it into a keg. Uh, you know, that's, that's been done before too, but, uh, uh, I really don't want to put up with the mess at the bottom of the keg either. I'd, I'd just soon have it all cleared out uh, before I do that. But the, you know, the, the part that, that I'm stuck at with this, uh, comes to the honey. Now, typically, uh, you know, you just, you can't just dump a whole bunch of sugar into a beer recipe because many times I, I've read the yeast isn't going to put up with that. I mean, it's like, you know, they're going to go like, whoa, you know, what are you doing? And, you know, they're, they're not going to do anything. And, uh, so you got to be very careful about how much, you know, fermentable sugar you add to, uh, you know, to this whole thing, especially when you're using these beer yeast from what I understand. So that presents. Yeah, another... Go ahead. Yeah, and, and I was just going to say that's a little bit of, of what I was alluding to earlier when I had mentioned I'm kind of blending together two recipes. So looking at the, the black IPA recipe itself, it actually calls for a little bit north of nine pounds of a dark malt syrup. And then what I'm thinking is rather than just adding in a bunch of honey to that, because like you say, the, you know, the, the yeast and particularly these ale yeasts may not handle the that high of a gravity so well so what what i was thinking about doing is scaling it back and taking it down from from nine pounds of the dark malt syrup to about six and then adding in maybe another nine pounds of honey and then potentially using the d47 wine yeast instead again that's what i've used for for the braggots that i've made before and have actually been very pleased with the results that I've gotten. So um, yeah. that's that's kind of what I'm penciling in at this point, and, and definitely interested to hear what both of your thoughts are about that approach. Uh, the, you know, the other thought that I had is maybe just scale back the, the amount of honey and malt extract as well for that very reason that, that you're, you're talking about, J.D. Yeah. Well, the... Um uh, interesting. Uh, now, now my question is, how does how is the yeast going to? Uh, I'm looking. I mean, the bottom line with with the, with my project, I'm, I'm looking for a, more of a beer a beer like uh, quality to it. So, how much is that going to detract? How much is the yeast uh, going to going to add or or detract? from that 
flavor profile, I wonder if I, you know, if you go to a, a wine yeast instead of a beer or an ale yeast. And I think it's a legitimate question. I, de- I definitely would imagine you'd get more of a traditional beer style or beer flavor from a beer yeast. Um, you know, if you if you think back to that braggot that I sent to you, what were your thoughts about that? Did did you find that to have more of a, a wine character or more of a, a beer character to it? I no, I, I thought it had more of a beer character to it. I uh, you know it, it it just needed just a tad more hops to it, and I I mean I loved it. Uh, I thought it was great, uh, and I, and and it was to me it tasted it had a beer quality to it. That's why I liked it. Uh, so that and that uh, was with the D forty seven. You know, just uh, the malt and the malt and hops are going to give you a, a, a significant beer like quality okay. on their own too. So just just well, something to think Aaron's about. Other meat also had a beer quality to them. You would mention that too, even the traditionals as well. Yeah, I thought. I mean, I could definitely taste a beer quality, and I'm wondering if it didn't get some of that from the failed attempt that you did with the beer yeast definitely could be I, i've hypothesized about that myself actually yeah i just and, uh and you it know not a bad thing at all it was it was good it just uh i i just couldn't figure out where that beer quality was coming from yeah yeah that you definitely know, could be i sometimes wonder just exactly how much does yeast contribute to you know the flavor, the you know the the, the end result. Uh, you know, I know that I, I've done some, I've done some just plain Jane ciders, just you know, uh, five gallons of just Mott's apple juice, and and dumped a Nottingham ale yeast in, nothing added, no nothing, take it all the way dry, and it tastes like it tastes like a beer. <laughs> You know, it, it, it's got a beer quality, but there's nothing beer about it other than yeast. Uh, you know, and I've used uh, I've used O five uh, uh, the S A uh, F uh, ale yeast O five uh, on a uh, on a uh, cider, and had the same thing. Uh, but that one I put sugar in, ate through all the sugar and everything, but uh, it had kind of a beer-like quality to it. So, uh, I uh, think it definitely has a significant impact. And I'll tell you as well. I remember serving that same braggot that you know you you had said had kind of a beer-like quality. I remember serving that to a friend of mine. And he just called it wine. <laughs> He's like, "Oh, this is good wine." Yeah. And I, I remember being kind of surprised by that, thinking, you know, this it's it looks like a beer. It's got a a, ho- a, a foam head, you know. Um, it's hoppy, fair, somewhat hoppy at least. Like to me, it's it's definitely beer like. But it's just interesting to me how, in this case, two different people could perceive it in in two different ways. Yeah. Well, um, I don't know. I, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not quite. I mean, I know this is the recipe I'm, I'm going to do. I'm definitely going to do this bourbon barrel porter. Um, I like the idea, Aaron, of maybe scaling back some of the malt and, and substituting, uh, you know, the honey in there. Um, and maybe a little extra honey to you know to maybe get that ten uh, percent that I'm looking for. But yeah, think- well, that's a decision that I've got to make too because I really haven't decided um, which direction I want to go. Do I want it to be more beer like or more mead like? And uh, if if I do want it to be more beer like, I'm certainly not going to scale back the malls. That's for sure. Um, if you do, then there goes your beer flavor. Yeah. Uh, so I really haven't decided what I'm going to do yet with that one. Um, 
Patty Mackey is listening in, apparently. I just got an email from her. She says that that Northern Brewer uh, Bourbon Barrel Porter kit is a winner. Made it for her husband's 50th birthday. Brewed it again and entered it in a local brew contest. Took first place. So, nice. uh, <laughs> so she says you should brew it first as the kit. Uh, and then try it as a braggot. Uh, Patty, that just, you know, that might be a pretty good idea. Um, Ooh. That's just another, you know, for him to make another five gallons. Yeah, you just try, yeah, give me another, make another, yeah, so there you go. Um, but congratulations on the, uh, on the first place, Patty, yeah, and thanks for the email. Um, in fact, if you want to call the show and talk about it with us, uh, please feel free. The number is... 818-921-4680, 818-921-4680. In fact, if anybody's listening to the live show, uh, you're more than welcome to call us any time during the show and uh, yeah, talk well, about it. Uh, uh, Patty, you've got my email. Why don't you uh, let me know how that that uh, little project we were talking about is coming along with the cherries. Oh yeah, we got to update the cherry, uh, the cherry mel mel too. Yeah, I gave well, Patty a, a slight variation on it. Uh, she was looking for something a little bit differently, so uh, a little bit different than what we did on air. So uh, I sent her a slight variation, and I don't know what she decided to do about that, but uh, I think she went with it, and I haven't heard from her how it turned out. Yeah. Well. Um... You know, oh, I need gonna... to say something else too. Before I'm sorry, JD. I yeah, didn't go mean ahead. To interrupt you. Uh, if uh, if Eric Bosick is listening, uh, dude, sorry I haven't gotten back with you. Uh, he emailed me a while back uh, asking about the uh, heart murmur project, and you know we were kind of talking about that hot and heavy for a while, and then it kind of fell on the back burner. Um, it's still here. It's still going, and uh, I will get you the recipe. In fact, I'll get everybody the recipe. Uh, you know, life gets in the way and things have been busy, but hey, don't give up on me. Just bear with me, and, and uh, Eric, I'll get with you as soon as I can. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, we, um, you know, I, I think. Uh, I mean, I still have. I still have some more questions, and I still have some more reading to do. And uh, I really, I, I gotta just sit down and go through this hop list and look at these hops, and uh, get a little more in tune uh, with them, and you know, figure out what, uh, you know, uh, what that's all about. Um, the only thing that scares me about. Uh, about this honey edition is, you know, like I said, I mean, reading up on, on these braggots and all these, all these beer yeast. Now that's if I go to the beer yeast is, you know, knowing that, you know, a lot of these beer yeast don't put up a lot of, a lot of honey. So now you are talking maybe step feeding the honey in, but then, you know, how do you know had to get to that 10%? So there's, there's much more to this that uh, that I probably need to learn first before I, uh, you know, just dump I, stuff in the fermenter. I think they're going to put up with a lot more than you think. Uh, I think uh, when think. You, you take a beer, yeah, you take a beer yeast and you start putting it in mead and and other things. Uh, that's a game changer. Everything changes at that point, and uh, you know. Uh, who was it, Bray Denard, who came up with the uh, Bray's one-month mead, and he uses a Belgian yeast, uh, Belgian ale yeast, and, um, you know, he actually had some trouble there for a while getting the thing to kind of slow down because it just went wild when he put it in the honey must. And uh, uh, he was he actually did one, I believe. I, I think I read where he step-fed one of the meads using that ale yeast and ended up getting it up to something ridiculous like 18 or 19 percent ABV or something. So, wow. um, yeah, I think there's probably uh, there's probably more there that it's capable of doing than, than we're giving it credit for. So, yeah, 
And, you know, just one other thought along those lines, you could always start off with the ale yeast. And if you have, you know, a failure to launch or it doesn't start to ferment, then you could always go back and, and pitch something else as well. So um, just a, another thought there. And then one other thought I have while we're still on the, the topic of braggots here, earlier in the show we were talking about the importance of having headspace in your fermentation vessel. And just a, a word of caution for, for those that have not brewed a braggot before. Um, in, in the couple that I've done, I, I usually use a, a six and a half gallon um, glass carboy as my primary fermenter. And even with, you know, one and a half gallons of extra headspace on the top there, these braggots just go nuts with the, the craisin or the, the um, foam, the, the yeast foam that collects at, at the top, um, which I even got with the D47, interestingly. Um, and it, in, in the first one that I did, it actually clogged up my airlock, and I had a little bit of a, a mead volcano. So um, I would definitely consider getting yourself like a nice blow-off tube or something like that in case you, you do have a very active fermentation with a, a very, you know, big craisin. Yeah, yeah and with a, without any knowledge of, of this, just working on my own theory, I would probably attribute that to the protein content in the malts. That would make sense. Huh. Yeah, so that's going to form, you know, any kind of amino acid like that, if you can ever get it to foam, it's going to form stable bubbles. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to make a foam there that's not going to go away that easily. Interesting. That's one of the reasons that, as, as I understand it, it's one of the reasons that uh, uh, certain beers are capable of holding a, a better head than others. So. That could be could be the problem there. Well, um, but I could be wrong. I thought I was wrong once before, but I was mistaken. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, Patty. Uh, I apologize to Patty. Uh, She's been trying to call, but for some reason, I'm not able to get her in. So we're going to give Patty a call. So uh, uh, let's see if I can't uh, get her in here. Um, a darn. Uh, one too many meads. One too many meads. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, you know, it just seems like every time I turn around, uh, there's something different. Uh, see, no, it, don't, it doesn't even let me make a darn call. I mean, I, I don't get you this. Do. That's <laughs> the problem. You're not actually turning around. It's just the me. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's try this. It just... Um, here we go. Let's try this. Add to group call. We're going to try calling Patty Mackey here. And uh, Microsoft uh, bought Skype here just, I think it was a couple of years ago. And it seems like every time I turn around, they keep updating this Hello. thing. And there she is, Patty. Hello, this, this is Patty. And this is JD, Chris, and Aaron on the Mead House. I know you've been trying to call. I apologize. Uh, if I if I were to take your call, it was actually going to put the other two guys on hold. Uh, oh, I figured there was some <laughs> computer glitch. Yeah, but uh, thank you for the email and congratulations on the uh, on the first place with that uh, bourbon barrel. Yeah, we've actually brewed this one three times now, and oh, wow. uh, it's a real winner. I wouldn't change anything about it, it oh. as a beer. It's a great one. What, but uh, I, can, uh, I can see it as a great braggot as well. So, what would you? Uh, well, let's talk about the braggot aspect. How would you? Uh, how would you go about uh, adding the honey? I mean, would you take out some of the malt extract, or just add the honey on top of it, or how would you approach that? 
I think I would leave the recipe as it's written, as as a bourbon barrel porter, um, and even the yeast, because you don't want to unbalance the beer part of it. You want to keep that character. Right. And I think um, I would probably go about step feeding the honey in, so as not to overwhelm the yeast. Yeah, see, that's the part that I'm afraid of because I don't, I don't want to go overboard with the alcohol either. I just, I want to keep it right around ten percent. Uh, you know, I, I don't want be, I don't want people keeling over after drinking one bottle of, you know. <laughs> uh, this one uh, ends up, as a beer, this one ends up around nine, nine and a half already. Oh, does it? Oh, holy cow! Yeah. Yeah, I say stun them. I'm putting the honey in all at once. I want them to know. I want those yeast to know what their role is from the <laughs> very beginning. It may stall on you. Yeah, here, here it because is. Because the, the beer is. yeast is just, uh, you know, not. you're going to end up with something in uh, 1.110 probably is a starting gravity, somewhere around 68 pounds of honey. If you want to make a true braggot that's 51% honey and 49% beer. But you can always I, scale I, it back. I already know for the fa- for a fact that the Irish uh, red ale will handle 10 pounds of honey in that recipe. So, uh, because I did that one already. So, that's not a problem. Yeah. 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 Well, maybe I just uh, I just might go with the uh, six pounds, a little better than six pounds. Just make it a full on fifty one percent, you know, honey honey bracket. What uh, higher higher gravity than just the would have been? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I just I wanted something that was nicely drinkable. I didn't want something that I, you know, I don't want something that's wine like. I wanted something that was more beer like. Uh and uh just just I mean I, I love a good bourbon anyway and I uh, and a nicely oaked bourbon at that. Uh mm-hmm. And that recipe, I just kept I saw that recipe and I kept going back to it after going through the whole list of recipes and and kits, and I kept coming back to that, and it just looked intriguing. Uh, and I just thought, you know what? I need to do this as a braggot. I love that braggot that Aaron sent me, uh, and I think I, I, this may be my my calling to mead <laughs> uh, because I just have not been satisfied with some of the other things that I've done. Um, I've curious. done one, one braggot before. And that was that Northern Brewer kit. Yeah. What, it was okay. What um, what uh, bourbon did you use? Uh, Maker's Mark. Maker's Mark. Okay. That seems to be a pretty popular one. Did you use that on all three of them? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is there is there a reason why you chose Maker's Mark, or uh, you just kind of went along with Mark. everybody else? That's my husband's favorite. That's your, okay. <laughs> hey, I made right. this first as a 50th birthday present for him. Awesome. And he, he liked it so well, we rebrewed it again the following year for his birthday, and that's the one that got entered in the local contest, and it took first place in, in that category. Wow. And you did it just strictly according to the recipe? Yep. Wow. Wow, I've got, I, I got to agree with Patty on this one. You, you're you wanting to stay with the more beer-like, and uh, I agree with Patty. You you shouldn't diminish the, the amount of malt extract in lieu of honey. Yeah, you lose the base beer that you're going for. Yeah. If you yeah. unbalance it like that. What do you think, Aaron? Do you think that's a good call? Just leave it as is and dump the honey in. You know, I, I think it's definitely a, a, a good point because, uh, you know, I, I think the beer character that you're going for is something you definitely would want to preserve. And, um, you know, I, I think earlier Patty had, had mentioned possibly doing the, the step feeding of the honey. That may be a good 
kind of hybrid approach as well. Um, but, you know, I, I think it, it certainly doesn't hurt to try. Well, here's yeah. another thought. Um, get your kit and brew it as a beer. And then you must have some just traditional mead sitting around because the other way of going about making a braggot is to simply blend a beer and a mead. That's you true. could take a portion of your beer kit and blend in some sack mead, and you'd have a very good idea of what you'd have as a braggot. Yeah. And then you'd have That's both nice. separate and blended before you ever ferment them together. Yeah. That's a valid way to make a braggot. I know. I don't. Uh, I have no doubt that uh, that I'm going to enjoy it. Uh, I mean, provided everything works out, you know, according to plan. But uh, my first braggot was the one that Aaron had sent me, and um, I really liked it. Uh, you know, we talked about it uh, earlier in the show. My only uh, my, I guess it's not really even a negative. Uh, I just wish it had it was a little more hops to it, a, a little more beer quality to it, uh, a little more beer character maybe and, and flavor. But other than that, it was outstanding. I loved it. Uh, well, I, uh, you know, like I said, that's that's the that's the recipe I'm going to do. And Patty, thanks for the call. I think you, you, you just settled this completely for me. Uh, well, I guarantee you'll love it as a beer, and I can I can picture it as a braggot, so yeah. I'll be interested to see how that turns out. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and to uh, answer Chris's question, I haven't started my cherry melomel yet. My son and his uh, wife bought a new house, and for the last three months I've been remodeling a house, so I haven't even started my cherry melomel yet. Oh boy! Yeah. Well, good luck with it, and uh, that's uh, that recipe that I sent you. That's one that I make over and over, and it's proven. So, uh, yeah, that's what I'm going to go with. Um, yeah, they just got moved in over Labor Day weekend, so now I'm free to go back to brewing. Yeah, don't don't <laughs> slip on the honey though, because that gravity needs to be way on up there to balance with that much tart cherry. So, don't be yeah. don't be scared of that. Don't be scared of the high gravity. Uh, no, that's never scared me off before. I've, d- I've done stuff as high as 1170. Yeah. Wow. That's a, you know, you're going to be up in that, that area. You're going to be close to that. So, uh, probably like, you and uh, Chris. 11, I'm anxious to try my new temperature control stainless yeah, brewer. You're, so you're going to all I got put on hold when the, when the, when the, when the kids bought a new house. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're going to enjoy that for sure. Um, yeah, that's that's got to be like torture to to have a new toy like that and not be able to use it right away. <laughs> I know it's oh. sitting there in the middle of my living room still, and I see it every day. But oh boy. Okay. Well, hey, Patty. Uh, thanks a million, and you just settled it for me. That's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to brew that recipe. I'm going to add the honey to it. It's going to be a 51 percent. Uh, you know, stay with the style. Uh, it's a done deal. So uh, all, I, all I have to do now is just figure out what bourbon I want to use. I have several that I do enjoy, uh, but I want to be very careful about which ones I choose, too. So, um, But uh, appreciate the call, uh, Patty, and uh, call us again anytime, uh, anytime we're on here, Tuesday nights. Yep, I get off and listen in, though, quite a bit of the recorded version too. So <laughs> very good. Yeah. Take it easy, Patty. Good to hear from you. Thanks for the call, Patty. Oh yes, my cherry. Oh, we missed it there. Cut you. You were cut out a little bit there. Say it again. Do we lose Patty? Oh, there she goes. Okay. Um, she was cutting out there a little bit at the end, but. Uh, uh, certainly appreciate Patty calling the show. Uh, Patty's been a long-time listener uh, here at the Mead House. Um, I kind of, I, I, you know, I uh, I got this email a long time ago, and uh, somebody had visited our website, and they asked if we could do uh, a segment on carbonating. 
And I told him, well, you know, we'll put it on the list. Uh, I really don't know much about it, but, uh, you know, we'll see what we can do. Well, I still don't know a whole lot about it. But I hear people talking about volume of CO2. Now, let me see if I can explain this to you. There are 22.4 liters in one mole of gas. So a beer carbonated to two volumes of CO2 will have about 0.0892 moles of gas per liter. That makes 1.688 moles of gas in five gallons at two volumes. That is equal to about 0.163 pounds of CO2. One volume is one liter of CO2 at one atmosphere, about 15 pounds in one liter of fluid beer. Did you get that? Got it. Can you repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea, okay? Uh, <laughs> yeah. People talk about volume. How many volumes, uh, you know, how many volumes of carbonation did you add? Really? Volumes? I don't know, about eight gallons. How does that sound? Uh, how many volumes? I have no idea. Um, here's the deal, okay? Uh, I know that, you know, you can add, it, it seems like it, all the recipes that I've looked at and Everybody that I've that I've you know post uh, on homebrew talk, I'm you know looking at people's recipes, people talking about carbonating. If you're going to bottle your stuff, if you don't have a keg set up, it looks to me like anywhere from four to five ounces of priming sugar. Now that's it's pretty important to use this priming sugar, corn sugar basically, uh, yeah. dissolved in hot water. Uh, let it cool down just a little bit, okay, uh, and then put it in your priming bucket just before, uh, a good time to do it, actually, is when you're racking into your bottling bucket, uh, you know, put your priming sugar, you know, solution in, mix it up really, really good, uh, and then go ahead and bottle. Two, three weeks, four weeks, if, you know, uh, and uh, you should have some carbonated beer. Now, the other method that uh, Chris and I have talked about uh, involves a kegging system. And you simply keg your product uh, and hook your CO2 uh, cartridge or canister up to it. Cartridge. You know where that comes from? Being a kid with a BB gun. <laughs> CO2 cartridge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Uh, hook your CO2 tank up to it and crank the uh, crank the pressure up to about 25 to 30 pounds and tip it over on its side and just gently rock it back and forth for about 10 minutes. Uh, you don't have to shake it up. You don't have to agitate the crap out of it. Just... Gently rock it back and forth. Do that for about 10, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. There's really no time frame. Uh, and then stand it upright. Uh, leave it at 25 pounds, 30 pounds for about 24 hours. And then take a taste the next day and see what you get. Uh, it worked for me. That's uh, how I carbonated my wife's, uh, you know, porter. And uh, like I said, it worked just fine. So uh, I turned the uh, the regular down. Uh, my serving pressure is about nine and a half pounds. Uh, it keeps the beer nicely carbonated. Uh, it's got a nice head on it when it comes out of the tap into the glass. Uh, and that's about as much as I know about carbonating. So Chris, Aaron, if you guys got something more to add. Well, Go as ahead. far as the uh, as far as carbonating with a keg, uh, I haven't done a lot with it. But the things that I have done have all come with with a suggested pressure or volume. So, um, you know, I've I've got this uh, hydromel, this fruit hydromel that I do that's that's carbonated, and it's uh, three volumes. So uh, I've got this chart that I look on, and it tells me what pressure to set it at um, based on my altitude above sea level. 
So, uh, and temperature, uh, right? And temperature, yes. And uh, but you know, base, basically, uh, everything I've done, I've been told how to do it. So uh, I haven't done a lot of experimenting with it. Uh, when I first got the keg, um, I just wanted to play around with it and see what it would do. So I uh, I filled it up with water and uh, carbonated it, and, and it spewed everywhere, and I found out that I better follow the instructions. So that's what I did ever since. Yeah. Aaron, have you, uh, well, I know you carbonate stuff, but what's your method of? So I don't have a kegging system, and all of the carbonation I've done is just bottle conditioning. So usually what I do is five ounces of priming sugar, just as you described earlier, and I, I think you did a real good job covering that process. You know, I'll, I'll just boil a small amount of water, add in that priming sugar, let it cool, and then rack on top of that in the bottling bucket, um, and then put that in the bottles, and away we go. Like you say, maybe two weeks, three weeks, four weeks later, um, just a a small fermentation occurs inside the bottle and because it's still sealed in the bottle, the carbon dioxide that's released from, from the yeast remains trapped in the bottle and, and just produces a nice naturally carbonated beer. Um, so that's the method I usually use. Yeah. Yeah. There's, no. another, there's another issue that we need to address here, uh, about our bracket project is, uh, uh, the fact of when we do this now with a braggot, as I said before, the other one that I made, it required some aging in the carboy before it was ready to be bottled and drinkable. Sure. And um, so what we're going to have an issue with is how long are we going to have to age it? And then if you decide to bottle condition it, um, of course, I know you've got a kegging system, but for those people who, who don't, um, you're going to have to ask yourself, is this yeast still viable? So it could be one of those situations where you need to add in some yeast at bottling time uh, in order to, to get that bottle conditioning effect. Otherwise, the, the yeast, the residual yeast that's left in your, in your braggot may not be viable any longer. Especially if you, you know, let this thing age for a year or more before you bottle it. So, Yeah. Well, and I'm not anticipating letting mine age that long. I'm, I'm hoping that it won't take that long. Um, good thought. Uh, yeah, I'm, I wish I had taken better notes or, or had uh, could find my notes on the braggots I've done. I had... Definitely did not let it age that long, but it was in the secondary for a while. I, I would say probably four to five months, um, and, and with that amount of time, I, I was able to get a nice bottle conditioning going, um, but Chris, that's absolutely a good point. If, if we are aging these for a significant amount of time, that's, that's certainly one way to go is just pitch a, a little bit of fresh yeast at the time of bottling. Well, and they yeah, make a, a... There's a little option, too, J.D. A third option is these little uh, bottling, uh, uh, what do they call them, fizz drops or something like that. Yeah. It's just a yeah. measured amount of sugar. And I think they even make some little capsules that have a combination of sugar and yeast. And yeah. you basically bottle your beer or whatever, and you drop one in each bottle and... Right, uh, you're gu you're guaranteed fresh yeast and and enough priming sugar for that bottle. So, uh, yeah, third option. And I, you know, I may actually go with that. Uh, it's just a lot less trouble than mixing up priming sugar and and more than likely a lot more accurate. Well, and the one thing about priming sugar um, that we should probably mention too, it's just this is not a matter, especially if you're you know just learning about this and doing it for the first time. You just, you know, the water, you just can't use warm water and think you're going to dissolve the sugar and put it in your in your bottling bucket. It needs to be boiled for at least five minutes uh, because the priming sugar uh, may come with some, you know, uh, bacteria that you just don't, you know, 
you don't want to add to your, uh, you know, to your to your uh, recipe. So you need to boil it for at least five minutes. And that's, I mean, everything that I've read about doing this is, you know, boil the water. You know, when you put your priming sugar in, bring it to a boil uh, and boil it for five minutes. So uh, be sure to do that at least. Um, you know, it, you know, it's, it's clear. It's clear to me that you know we're 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 a ways off. I mean, this this braggot recipe isn't going to come together next week for sure. I mean, there's still, I think, a lot more uh, that we need to do. Uh, uh, you know, more reading. Um, uh, Patty uh, Mackey, she helped me make my decision tonight on on the honey dilemma. Uh, I'm just going to go with. You know, an equal actually fifty one percent, six and a half pounds, I guess it would be, and call it done. But I still need to learn more about the hops. I need to make my bourbon selection. Uh, so there's a lot more to be done. So, um, and I know you two probably have uh, you know some reading and 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 some you know fine tuning that you guys want to do as well, but. Uh, that being said, uh, I kind of wanted to touch on one of Chris's favorite uh, uh, styles uh, because we're coming upon the season, Chris. Apple season. Sizers. Sizers. Yes. What absolutely. is a size? Uh, and this is why I, this is why I wish Jeff was here to you know go through and explain the whole sizer thing to us uh, as our resident uh, mead judge and. And whatnot, but uh, sizers are uh, basically what, Chris? Well, to me, uh, it's a traditional mead where you take out the water and replace it with apple juice, and um, that's a very simple explanation. Now, there's all sorts of things you can add in with it, and uh, all sorts of different apple juices that you can use. Um, I think the blend of apples is everything in a sizer. Uh, unfortunately, here in the United States, we have uh, a very limited selection, although that is improving slowly uh, as the cider industry sort of kicks in and becomes more popular. Uh, a lot of the growers are uh, are turning to cider apples again. You know, back before Prohibition, uh, there was... Uh, we had a, a good selection of cider apples in this country, and then when Prohibition came along, uh, the apple growers uh, needed a way to stay in business, so they uh, they did away with all the cider apple trees and planted uh, dessert apples. So now all the supermarkets are overrun with Red Delicious and oh my God, yeah, <laughs> and all that kind of thing. So uh, uh, and and it pretty much wiped out the cider apple business in the united states and uh but it's slowly coming back people are rediscovering cider and uh it's becoming uh i, I think it may end up being the next craft beer uh type boom you know in this country and uh so it's I definitely think, coming back oh i you know and i think you're i think you're right i mean the whole cider uh I, i've noticed in in liquor stores and my supermarkets uh, down the beer aisle, there used to be maybe one or two six packs of hard ciders, and then there was three or four. Now there's a whole there's a whole freaking shelf full of them. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, and there's, uh, we have lots of specialty beer stores around, and uh, and there's at least uh, I would say twenty five percent of their stock now is is some sort of sizer or uh, some sort of cider. cider. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I, and I think one of these days, I think Mead is going to have that same kind of boom if we can ever all get our act together and and yeah. get everybody educated on what it is and what it should be and and uh, get people to approach it with an open mind. But back to the sizer issue. Uh, in its simplest form, it's it's apple juice and honey. Uh, but from there, uh, you can just basically go wild with it. You can make an entirely different sizer 
uh, by changing the profile of apple juice, different kind yeah. of apple juice, uh, much the same way you can change a traditional uh, with just changing the honey or just changing the yeast. So, uh, you know, it, it's in this big complex thing that we've been talking about and how many variations, almost limitless. Uh, now you just add a whole nother uh, level of, of complexity to it by adding in apple juice. Yeah. And uh, and you can make all sorts of sizers. I mean, there's it's just... Uh, it's just really limitless almost. And, you know, the, what I really enjoy about them is that they're, they're so easy to ferment. Um, they, you don't really have the stuck fermentation problems with sizers that you do with, with traditionals. Um, in fact, uh, if you're, you know, we were talking earlier about the foam overs and meat eruptions and things, uh, you really yeah. got to be careful with the sizer because they they ferment vigorously. Um, something about apples that yeast like, and uh, uh, but, but I really want to get into that when the season gets here. Uh, it's kind of the reason I wanted to hurry up and get this braggot going because uh, I want to get that uh, pretty much squared away by by apple season. Uh, does does your wife uh, like sizers? Oh yeah, absolutely, and well, cider too. Then, and uh, then, then you just you go to her tonight, Chris, and you tell her that, honey, I'm going to make your favorite sizer. I need a stainless steel fermenter. <laughs> that worked oh, for no, me. I, I can't go stainless <laughs> steel. No, that's. Uh, oh no, no. <laughs> no, no, that was. Uh, I think I've got some kind of mojo against uh, stainless steel fermenters for me. Uh, <laughs> I've I've, okay. I've I've fermented in uh, in plastic buckets for okay, so long. Okay, another plastic but, bucket, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, I might be able to talk her into letting me buy another bucket, though. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, spring another twelve <laughs> bucks for another bucket. <laughs> yeah, can I borrow right. twelve bucks? Uh, <laughs> oh my uh, god! But, uh, but anyway, uh, you know. I'm really looking forward to it. Sizers are just so, they're so simple and easy to do. And, uh, but yet you can make them so complicated and you can go so far with them. Um, I, I mean, I think we're going to have fun with it. And, uh, just like this braggot thing, it's, uh, it's going to yeah. be a step out. You know, I've already done a lot of variations of sizers. And, and so this year, I think I want to really try something different. I really want to go far out with it and, and do something I've never done before. Uh, I think I mentioned to you that I'm uh, actually going to be working on a homemade apple press so I can yep. press my own apples. And uh, Yep, we so, want pictures, we want documented. Uh, absolutely. Get it up on we'll, a yeah. yeah, we'll get some blueprints for it. And, uh, there you go. Uh, we'll uh, see what we can get drawn up and everybody can make a you know, another day I saw a homemade apple grinder, so uh, yeah. I may end up making both, and then I can grind them and then press them. And, uh, there you go. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, well, the, the sizers can really, that's a, God, that's a huge area for us to get into. We could talk for weeks and weeks about it. Well, I wanted to get an early start because, uh, you know, like I said, we're right around the corner. Uh, I don't know about your neck of the woods, but uh, apple season is coming on here, uh, out here where we're at. So uh, usually October, November, that's it for us. So that's right around the corner. But uh, I thought yeah, we'd I get an early start and uh, at least get it, uh, you know, uh, start talking about it. And uh, we'll probably go in a little more depth. Uh, you know, on future shows, and then uh, start talking about putting some recipes together. But um, I usually wonder... make my sizers in October. It's usually, uh, getting close to Halloween, I, that's when I do my sizers. You, so. you know, you know, that's like next month, right? Yeah, I know. That's, that's okay. why I want to get this bracket <laughs> going. Because I don't think she's going to let me have another twelve bucks for another bucket. <laughs> All right, and then uh, finally, I want to wrap up tonight, uh, Chris, with the cherry mead update. Where are we with the cherry melomel or 
the chair actually it wasn't a was it a mellow mel? No, it was a. Uh, well, I guess it is a mellow mel, isn't it? It's cherry. Yeah, it's a, it's a cherry chocolate. Uh, yeah. That we ended up with. Um, so at this point, uh, I'm in secondary clearing. Well, I'm, I've come off of the chocolate, and I'm in technically tertiary. Uh, and, and I'm just letting it sit and clear for now. I've got some. Uh, I've got a little bit of oil residue on top from the chocolate, which is to be expected. Um, it's tasting. It's it's going to be there. The taste is there. It needs a little bit of time to come around. You know, this was the project I was working on when my refrigerator went out. So um, I lost my cooling at some point there, and I got a few fusels in there. Not too bad. Uh, I think uh, maybe probably by Christmas this thing's going to be good. So those of you who didn't have those cooling issues, you, you may already be good to go now. Um, I'm going to let mine sit probably until December and uh, maybe bottle it up and have it ready for Christmas and New Year's. Yeah. So uh, uh, pretty much we've done all the major stuff. Um, but I will say this, everybody, you know, I gave you some leeway uh, in the starting gravity and, and ending gravity. So um, we're going to let this thing sit for a while and then... At some point in the future, we're going to do a tasting, and we'll talk about making adjustments at that time. We, but we All need right. to let it get, we need to let it settle down a little bit more, let it get a little bit more age on it, and let some of the flavors come back. Then we'll taste it, and we'll talk about possible uh, sweetness issues. Uh, it may need a little extra sweetness. It may need uh, some tannin adjustment. Um, so we'll, we'll discuss all that, uh, once we give it time to kind of sit and get some age on it. And, uh, for those of you who live this side of the Mason Dixon line, all is oil. So <laughs> just said to throw that all is oil. O I L. So, uh, well, I guess that's going to pretty much wrap it up for uh, tonight's edition of the Mead House. Uh, kind of glad to be back from vacation here and uh, get back in the, in the uh, work of things. Kind of missed Jeff tonight. Uh, I'm sure he'll be back next week. Uh, we'll be in touch with him uh, as well. But uh, keep thinking about those braggot recipes. Thanks, Patty, for uh, giving us a holler here tonight and uh, talking uh, braggots with us. Congratulations again on that first place uh, with that bourbon barrel out there. And uh, I'm just, I'm going to have to get me a bottle of Maker's Mark and just try it. I've never had it. So uh, i gotta, I got to figure that one out. So uh, i tell you what, we'll be back next week, next Tuesday night, 9 o'clock, right here at the Mead House. Uh, you can catch up uh, on the, on the uh, Mead House.